Then a man's voice from the adjoining bedroom. "'What's the matter?' She did not answer, but went on, in a tone which was a soliloquy rather than an exclamation, and a dirge rather than a soliloquy. Mrs. Brooks could only catch a portion. "'And then my dear, dear husband came home to me, and I did not know it, and you had used your cruel persuasion upon me. You did not stop using it, no, you did not stop my little sisters and brothers and my mother's needs. They were the things you moved me by, and you said my husband would never come back, never and you taunted me and said what a simpleton I was to expect him, and at last I believed you and gave way. And then he came back. Now he is gone, gone a second time, and I have lost him now for ever, and he will not love me the littlest bit ever any more, only hate me. Oh, yes, I have lost him now, again because of you. In writhing with her head on the chair, she turned her face towards the door, and Mrs. Brooks could see the pain upon it, and that her lips were bleeding from the clench of her teeth upon them, and that the long lashes of her closed eyes stuck in wet tags to her cheeks. And she continued, "'And he is dying. He looks as if he is dying.' and my sin will kill him and not kill me. Oh, you have torn my life all to pieces, made me be what I prayed you in pity not to make me be again. My own true husband will never, never, oh, God, I cannot bear this, I cannot. There were more and sharper words from the man, then a sudden rustle. She had sprung to her feet. Mrs. Brooks, thinking that the speaker was coming to rush out of the door, hastily retreated down the stairs. She need not have done so, however, for the door of the sitting-room was not opened. But Mrs. Brooks felt it unsafe to watch on the landing again, and entered her own parlour below. She could hear nothing through the floor, though she listened intently and thereupon went to the kitchen to finish her interrupted breakfast. Coming up presently to the front room on the ground floor, she took up some sewing, waiting for her lodgers to ring that she might take away the breakfast, which she meant to do herself, to discover what was the matter, if possible. Overhead, as she sat, she could now hear the floorboards slightly creak, as if someone were walking about and presently the movement was explained by the rustle of garments against the banisters, the opening and the closing of the front door, and the form of Tess passing to the gate on her way into the street. She was fully dressed now in the walking costume of a well-to-do young lady in which she had arrived, with the sole addition that over her hat and black feathers a veil was drawn. Mrs. Brooks had not been able to catch any word of farewell, temporary or otherwise, between her tenants at the door above. They might have quarrelled, or Mr. D'Urberville might still be asleep, for he was not an early riser. She went into the back room, which was more especially her own apartment, and continued her sewing there. The lady lodger did not return, nor did the gentleman ring his bell. Mrs. Brooks pondered on the delay, and on what possible relation the visitor who had called so early bore to the couple upstairs. In reflecting, she leant back in her chair. As she did so, her eyes glanced casually over the ceiling, till they were arrested by a spot in the middle of its white surface which she had never noticed there before. It was about the size of a wafer when she first observed it but it speedily grew as large as the palm of her hand, and then she could perceive that it was red. The oblong white ceiling, with this scarlet blot in the midst, had the appearance of a gigantic ace of hearts. Mrs. Brooks had strange qualms of misgiving. She got upon the table, 
and touched the spot in the ceiling with her fingers. It was damp, and she fancied that it was a blood-stain. Descending from the table she left the parlour, and went upstairs intending to enter the room overhead, which was the bedchamber at the back of the drawing-room. But, nerveless woman as she had now become, she could not bring herself to attempt the handle. She listened. The dead silence within was broken only by a regular beat. Drip, drip, drip. Mrs. Brooks hastened downstairs, opened the front door, and ran into the street. A man she knew, one of the workmen employed at an adjoining villa, was passing by and she begged him to come in and go upstairs with her. She feared something had happened to one of her lodgers. The workman assented, and followed her to the landing. She opened the door of the drawing-room, and stood back for him to pass in, entering herself behind him. The room was empty. The breakfast, a substantial repast of coffee, eggs, and cold ham, lay spread upon the table, untouched, as when she had taken it up, excepting that the carving-knife was missing. She asked the man to go through the folding doors into the adjoining room. He opened the doors, entered a step or two, and came back almost instantly with a rigid face. "'My good God! The gentleman in bed is dead!' I think he has been hurt with a knife. A lot of blood had run down upon the floor." The alarm was soon given, and the house which had lately been so quiet resounded with the tramp of many footsteps, a surgeon among the rest. The wound was small, but the point of the blade had touched the heart of the victim, who lay on his back, pale, fixed, dead as if he had scarcely moved after the infliction of the blow. In a quarter of an hour the news that a gentleman who was a temporary visitor to the town had been stabbed in his bed spread through every street and villa of the popular watering-place. End of chapter 56